Good afternoon and welcome to the final concurrent session of the day, increasing student engagement with low to no prep activities. Our presenter today is Jennifer Merrill, Professor of Psychology at Skyline College. If you have any questions for the presenter during the session, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom room screen, and we will address them at the end of the talk. On that note, I will hand it over to our presenter. Great. Thank you so much, Julia. And hello, everybody. Thanks for hanging around. I know on the East Coast, it's a long day. Uh, I'm here on the West Coast and it's midday. So for those of you that have been in a lot of sessions, thank you so much for, for coming to this one. Wow. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. And the current slide. All righty. Well, as Julia mentioned, my name is Jennifer Merrill. I'm a professor of psychology at Skyline College, and uh, we're located about 15 miles south or so of San Francisco. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to No to Low Prep Classroom Activities. And honestly, these things that you're seeing on the screen right here are really all you're going to need for uh, all the activities that I'm going to be talking about. And you'll notice that there are things that you may have in your division, like supply closet, index cards, uh, colored markers, whiteboard pens. These are the giant post-it notes, right? Um, so I'll, I'll be talking more about these later, but this is an image of, of, of the different things that you'll be using with these activities. Now, before I share the activities, I'd like to start by talking about some benefits. You know, what are these activities bringing to the table? And here at Skyline College, we offer a series called Careers in Psychology. And that's a series where I have the opportunity to interview different types of psychologists, uh, just so students can learn about some of the really amazing things you can do in the field of psychology. And last semester, I had the opportunity to interview an industrial organizational psychologist. And those types of psychologists work in businesses. So they may be involved in hiring practices or in policy setting or in you know, uh, measuring employee morale and so on. And in that interview, the psychologist said something that really stuck with me. And that was people get hired because of their technical skills, but they get fired because of their behavioral skills. And one of these things that the activities that I'm going to mention will talk about is an opportunity to practice what are oftentimes referred to as 21st century skills. And a lot of these are the behavioral skills that that psychology or psychologist rather was talking about. For example, thinking critically, being able to work as a team and collaborate, being able to effectively communicate your thoughts both orally and in writing working on just social skills, right? Um, and actually yesterday I interviewed a psychologist. Uh, they are a user experience researcher. And when she was talking about some things that were real important in the job, she's like, you need to be able to communicate. You've got to be able to work as a team. You've got to be creative. And I felt like she just had this 21st skill checklist in front of her. Uh, and by the way, these are skills that employers are saying they really want their employees to have. So the activities I'm going to share with you uh, afford students an opportunity to work on some of these skills. Now, additionally, students, particularly after the pandemic, are coming back and it looks like they're wanting different things. They're saying, I don't want this transactional relationship where I show up and the teacher gives me information and then I spit it back and I get my degree and I move on, right? Like college is a hoop to jump through. And what I'm seeing more of is that students are saying, you know, I want a place where I belong. I want to create connections. I want to feel a sense of community in my campus and in my classroom. And coincidentally, this morning in the, the mailings, the emails that I get from Faculty Focus, they had a link to their podcast and it was on creating community in the classroom. So the activities I'm going to share with you also work on, on these attributes right here. Now I have a colleague, Dr. Uh, Dr. Suzanne Schubert, and she started using games in particular, games last semester. And she started to assess what her students were thinking about those games and what they were getting out of it. And if you take a look at these first three columns right here, you'll see that students said that once she started playing games, their participation and the interest in the course increased, their interactions with their classmates increased, and their focus in class and performance increased. 
And so what this says to me is student engagement, that these things I'm going to share with you offer opportunities for student engagement with the material, but with each other as well. And then Dr. Schubert wanted to know, well, what about content mastery? Does playing games contribute to content mastery? And again, she did some initial research and found that when she started implementing games after exam one, that her test scores went up. And of course, a lot of things could contribute to that, but certainly playing games could be one of those things. So practicing 21st century skills, creating that sense of community and belonging, uh, uh, engaging with the material in one another and content mastery are all benefits of some of the things or of all the things that I'm going to be sharing with you. There are also some costs and one is is that these will take away from class time to present material. So you may find that you've got to flip your class a little bit, maybe post some mini lectures or give students some things to do outside of class. So that's that's one cost. And then another real cost is that what I'm going to share with you may not be seen as academic, both by students and by, by faculty, because honestly, these things are fun. In some case, we are truly playing a game, right? Uh, and there's the idea, the bias may be that if the teacher is not talking to me and I'm not taking notes, then learning is not taking place, right? And that fun and learning are incompatible. If I'm having fun, I must not be learning. So that is a bias you may come up against. However, I'd like to point out these last three little bars here of Dr. Schubert's research. Do you like classes that have games? Should games be used as a learning tool? And should professors integrate games? And you can see that they all had a very positive response to that, felt that that was something that should be employed. Okay, so... Let's talk about the no prep activities. Now, these are things that you may plan in advance or things that you can just do on the fly. It works really well for both of those. And the first thing that I'm gonna discuss is, let me move things out of the way here. The first thing that I'd like to discuss is, I can't quite see, there we go. Uh, I need to move something out of the way. The first thing is music. And I'm hoping you see the word music there. I use music in all my classes and I, I use it as they're coming into class. So as they come in and I'm setting up, I have music playing. Uh, and about a week before the semester, I send out a welcome email, you know, welcoming them to the class. And I also include a link to a Jamboard. And I let them know that I'll be playing music as you come into class. And please send me songs that you really like and I'll play those for you as class is uh, waiting to begin. Sometimes though, I choose uh, the music that I'm going to play, and I may do that to introduce a topic, or I may do it to review a topic. Now, regardless of whether I'm going to introduce the topic or review the topic, I will always start with a prompt that pretty much is the same. How does this song relate to class? How does this artist relate to class? How does this video relate to course material, depending on what it is that I want them to focus on? And an example of how I use it to introduce a topic might be in my abnormal psychology class. Pardon me, I'm having a hard time seeing, there we go. Uh, in my abnormal psychology class, when I'm introducing the chapter on anxiety disorders, I may show, uh, or I may play a song by Shawn Mendes or show a video by Shawn Mendes and ask them, why did I choose this particular artist? Or maybe I play the song in my blood and ask them, why did I choose this particular song, right? Uh, and when the song ends, I ask them, check in with somebody, come down, write on the board. What do you think, what do you think's going on there? So it gets them starting to think about the course material. And of course I chose Sean Mendez because he's been very public about his diagnosis with anxiety. Uh, the song in my blood has lyrics that relate to anxiety. So it kind of gets students thinking in that particular way. So that's how I might use it to introduce a topic, but I also want to review topics as well. So in this case, I took time out of my a general psychology class when I was teaching the information on memory, took time out of class to play the song Tequila by Dan and Shay. And the prompt was on the board, how might this song relate to class? And if you're going to do this, if you're going to ask them to relate lyrics to um, some course content while the song is playing, I would really encourage you to have the, the words playing on the screen so they can see the words as well in the event they're not familiar with the song.
So I played down and chased tequila. After it was over, I asked them, you know, think for a couple of minutes, why did I choose this? You know, check in with the partner and come down to the board. You know, send somebody from your group down to the board to write what you think I was thinking of. Well, how did this song relate to course material? And in this situation, everybody was pretty much in the same area. They said context effect or state dependent memory. And that was exactly what I was looking for. But I'll tell you, students are super creative and they are thinking about stuff and making associations and connections that like I would never make. And this was uh, really brought home to me when I played the video right, for Def Leppard's Pour Some Sugar on Me. And before I started, I'm like, you guys know Def Leppard? And they were all who? And that traumatized me, right? But then once they heard the song, they're like, oh, yeah, right? So I played a video, Def Leppard's Pour Some Sugar on Me. And the prompt was, how does something in this video relate to what we've talked about in class? And when it was over, you know, they met in groups and they talked about it. And they came up with all sorts of amazing things. Like one group said, sugar excites you. So is it related to excitatory postsynaptic potentials, right? And another group said, well, they're using electric guitars. Is it like the electrical activity you see in an action potential? You know, all sorts of stuff. And I was like, no, but that's great. And you know, but that's great, right? Because <laughs> it all applied. Well, I had stopped the video at an image of the drummer. And I said, take a look at the drummer. What do you notice about the drummer? And eventually somebody will say, he only has one arm. It's exactly. So this is Rick Allen. He's the drummer for Def Leppard. And he was in a very, very bad car accident and his arm was amputated. And he had to refit the drum kit so he could play with his feet and one arm. And I said, what allowed him to do that? He had to relearn that. Those new, new neural connections need to be formed. What happened? And they're all, oh, neuroplasticity, right? Uh, and that's what I was thinking, but they came up with all sorts of creative things that worked really, really well, right? So this gave them an opportunity to engage with the material, think critically about the material. So that's music. Another thing that I do is sometimes I just want to get them moving, right? And, and these things can be planned in advance, like with the music, or you can do it on the fly. Um, I'm sure we've all had that time where we look out and we're just like, oh my gosh, because right? <laughs> we know we've lost them or they're getting really restless and we just want to get them moving. So I have two activities for that. And before I would do either one of them, I would begin with a prompt. And if I go back to my psychobiology course, the prompt may be, what neurotransmitter do you think is the most important and why? And one thing that is super critical uh, is before you move into the activities that you allow time for students to think, right? I know that sometimes when I'm asked a question and I automatically have to launch into an answer with a group, sometimes I'm kind of like, blah, 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 right? I need to think about it. I need to sit with the information for a minute. And I will take my phone and I'll set an alarm for maybe two minutes. And then they have to think critically about the information regarding neurotransmitters, right? What do those neurotransmitters do? What behaviors and skills that they influence or emotions that they influence, what are important to them, right? Um, so they really have to weigh the information. So giving them that time to think before they move into groups is really, really important. So once they've had time to think, one activity I may engage them in is something called hawks and eagles. So they've had time to think about their answer. And then I say, okay, everybody, I'd like you to pair up. And if your classes are like mine, they turn left or right, right? They don't, they don't move. They stay right where they are. And I'll say, okay, once you have your partner, I want you to decide who is the hawk and who is the eagle. And it doesn't matter, right? There's no importance to the designation. Just decide who's going to be the hawk and who's going to be the eagle. And then I'd like you to share your information with one another. So I give them a couple of minutes to do that, right? Which neurotransmitter they think is most important and why. And then after a period of time, I'll say, okay, hawks, raise your hand. Raise your hand up high. Keep it up high. And I love this kid right here. Look at his hand. He's like, whoa, right? Raise your hand high. Eagles get up, go fly to a new nest, right? Eagles, get up, go find a new hawk. And if you don't know that person, start by introducing yourself. Hi, my name is, right? And then share your information. 
So they get up and it's important that students keep their hands up high in the air until a new partner comes and sits with them. And then I let a couple of minutes go by and I'll say, okay, Eagles, it's your turn. Get your hand up in the air. Hawks, it's your turn to get up and walk, right? Uh, get up and go find yourself a new Eagle and then give them time. And again, if you don't know that person, please introduce yourself, right? Um, and by this time, they have now spoken with three people. At this point, depending on time, you can do it again, right? Or you can just end the activity. What I'll do sometimes is say, okay, everybody fly back to your own nest, right? Go back to your own seat uh, and brag on your classmates. What is something that, that somebody that you spoke to said that really made you think or gave you a new appreciation for a neurotransmitter or provided some information that you hadn't really thought about before? You know, brag about it and we'll put it up on the board. This activity uh, requires students to think critically about the information. They have to communicate their thoughts effectively, you know, orally. They are working on their social skills. They have to be flexible in their thinking. What if somebody has a different neurotransmitter and they don't agree with that, right? So they need to uh, exhibit some flexibility. Those things I just listed being examples of 21st century skills. So that talks an eagle. The next one is speed dating, right? So with speed dating, just to mix it up a little bit more, I might say, hey, everybody whose last name begins with A through M to that side of the classroom. If your last name is N through Z, you go to this side of the classroom. So you're up and they're moving and that mixes them up a little bit, right? So they're not maybe with the same people that they're usually sitting by. Now it's the, the same prompt, what neurotransmitter and why. And you can see that I have, uh, they're in groups of four and they're, they're pairs, right? Right across from each other. Please share your information with one another. And after a certain period of time has gone by, I say, okay, everybody take a step to the left, right? So they kind of go in a circle like this. If you don't know your new partner, please introduce yourself and then share your information. And you can, you know, go until everybody has had an opportunity to, to chat with the members in their group. You could also go outside and have people speed date by just moving from person to person. You could just line them up two long lines and do it that way. Um, but again, they are having to articulate their thoughts by communicating them orally and um, have worked critically with the information. All right, so those no prep activities was the use of music speed dating, and hawks and eagles. I'm gonna move on now to the low prep activities. And these are the materials that you'll need. So whiteboard pens, these are the big post-it notes. So they're like, I don't know, three feet by a foot and a half. Uh, they come in a pack of 30 and they're sticky on the back, just like a, a post-it note would be. A pack of index cards, this is just regular eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. And then these are some colored markers. Now um, I'm fortunate enough to teach in the same classroom. So I'll just keep a stash, you know, to keep a stash there. So I can do these on the fly or if I have the supplies there um, uh, or I can plan ahead, either one. So the first low prep activity I'm going to share with you is called crumple and shoot. My students love this game. This is the game that Dr. Schubert uses in her classes. Her students have given her great feedback. They will ask me, can we crumple and shoot, right? So what you need is blank paper. And I just get eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper and I tear them into squares of four. So they're about this big. A whiteboard pen. And you want a whiteboard pen because you want the ink to be thick. Uh, in some cases, you may be looking at writing from students in the back of the room, and you want the ink to be thick enough and dark enough for you be, to be able to see it. And then you want at least one garbage can. This class in particular is pretty competitive. So they go get other stuff and they assign different point values, like the tall one in the back. If you make that, it's three points and so on. So, but you truly only need one garbage can. So here's what happens with crumple and shoot. Step one is coming up with a team name and picking up supplies. And I tell my class, all right, everybody, I'd like you to get into groups of four or five. Right, no larger than five, four or five. 
And then once you're in that group, I'd like you to come up with a team name. And it'd be awesome if your team name could have something to do with what we're talking about in class. Right? And once you have your team name, send somebody down to write your team name on the board and pick up supplies. All right, so this is them coming down. You can tell we were talking about consciousness and different states of consciousness. We were talking about sleeping. Uh, baseball team is always the baseball team, right? uh, but these folks uh, uh, had a name related to course material, and they write their name on the board, and then they pick up a whiteboard pen, and they pick up those sheets of paper, and they head back to their group. All right, once everybody has that, it's time for step two, whoopsie there, what's happening? It's time for step two. And with step two, uh, you have, let's see, I'm kind of throwing because that picture wasn't supposed to come up, right? My apologies. With, with step two, uh, I say, okay, here's what's gonna happen. I am going to ask you all a question or I'm going to give you a situation and it's your job in your group to come up with the answer. Okay, now as a group, you're coming up with an answer, but only the person with the paper and the pen is going to write it down. And once you have that answer, don't show me. Do not lift up that paper until I say answers up. Okay, so they're all ready to go. I pose the question. They chow, they talk, they talk, they talk. They write it down and I wait, you know. It really depends on the class. You'll kind of gauge what's going on. But when I when I notice that you know people are are in the middle of writing, I'll say three, two, one, answers up. And you can see here that they've raised their answers up in the air. And if they get it right, come on down, right? And you can just look and go, yes, 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 yes. Or you might say, um, rehearsal, rehearsal, yes, come on down, you know, repeat the correct answer. And that leads us to step three. And step three is crumple and shoot. So if they got it right, answers up, they come down. And what you can't see is there's a seam in the floor. And this, you know, I always show students where the seam is. That's their line, right? And they crumple up their paper and they shoot it into the basket. Now to get points, you must answer correctly and make the paper in the basket. Right? You got to do both to get points. They cheer for one another. They support one another. They encourage one another. It's great. <laughs> then person comes back. They're back in their group. And I say, okay, I'm going to ask another question. But somebody else held that pencil and paper or the paper and the pen. You're still in your group, but somebody new is going to be the reporter. So that way, um, everybody in the group gets an opportunity to crumple and shoot. And then whoever gets the most baskets wins. Uh, and sometimes they just have bragging rights. Uh, but sometimes I have like I have a, ba a Ziploc baggie with fruit chews in it and stuff like that. And they love fruit chews. So um, this is a great activity. The next activity is a game of memory. And you might remember this from when you were a kid, right? Squares that you have upside down and you flip them over. And you can see here that there's a cactus here and they flipped over the other one and there's a cactus. So those match and I get to hold that match. But if they don't match, I got to turn them back over, right? And the next person has to remember where things are. Well, the memory game that I play, I often play on the chapter of memory. And the supplies that you need are index cards and an envelope. And I usually prep this in advance. So I know how many terms or how many cards I want them to have. And I just tuck those into the envelope. Now, what I'm going to show you next uh, might be a little bit overwhelming, but I've tried to, to make it so it's more manageable. I will tell students, I would like you to break into groups of five. And I know that I want them in groups of five because I have 10 terms that I want them to describe. So once they're in groups of five, I have somebody come down, pick up your envelope, okay, pick it up and take it back to your group. And then I want you to decide who's going to be in charge of what. Each of you is going to be in charge of two terms. And on one of your cards, you're going to create an example or a description of the term. And on the other card, you're going to write the name of the term. So for example, these are the 10 terms. 
And I might say, maybe I'm in the group and go, okay, I'm going to take terms one and two. So on one card, I'll write implicit memory. On the other card, I'll write a description. On another card, I'll write the spacing effect. On the other card, I'll write an example or a description or a definition. And my other group mates are doing it for the rest of those. Right, so here's a picture of uh, them working away on their index cards. And on that envelope, you might see writing. Just checking my time, you might see writing. And that's because I say, okay, group members, write your name on the envelope. Because if I'm going to give points for this, I want to know who to award, award points to. Uh, and then it's also, you know, you just keep the stuff in the envelope because you're going to be passing that to another group. Once you have written your cards and you have your class, your group mates look at them to make sure, yes, this is a good example. Everything looks correct. You trade that envelope with another group. And you can see that they've got those cards upside down. And I can happen to see that this card right here says implicit memory. And he's flipping a card over here. If it says implicit memory, good to go. You get that pair, right? But if not, both of those cards are going to be flipped back over. You're engaging with the material. You are engaging with one another. You're having to collaborate to decide who's going to be, you know, doing what. And so oh, on communication, written communication. So a lot of work on those 21st century skills. This also can, um, pardon me. This also can help with content mastery. So that is the memory game. This next activity, I, I love, I just love it. It's called Pictures Speak a Thousand Words. And uh, our students are just so creative. I gave you an example of that when, you know, the, they were applying things to music. But this is another way that students can show their creativity. <clears throat> and for this activity, they need those giant post-it notes. And I bring in a big box of colored markers. In psychobiology, I use this. I also use it in abnormal psychology. But in psychobiology, I'll break them into groups. And I'll say, okay, you, this group, you're in charge of these glial cells. This group, you're in charge of these cells. This group, you're in charge of these cells. Come on down, get a big piece of paper and some pens. And then here's their task. Create images that represent the function of the glial cells that were assigned to them. So they've got to think critically about that information, right? Okay, well, what do they do? And how can I relay that through an image? Um, over what, this is an opportunity for those students who are super creative to really shine. Students who are not creative overwhelmingly are in a group with somebody who is. This is a great way for students to show you that they understand the material in a way other than writing or taking a quiz, right? And so they work on those. And then we, we do a gallery walk. We put them up around the classroom walls and they walk around and look at one another's work. So here's an example of uh, what one person, one group did for oligodendrocytes. Uh, they wrap, wrap, wrap the myelin, wrap it like this, and it protects the axon, just like the bubble wrap, you know, protects an object. They had this racaleta, the, uh, a lollipop that has different layers, right, for the Schwann cells, layer, layer, layer. And if I go over here, we've got ependymal cells and then we've got microglia, oftentimes thought of as like the first responders in your brain. You can see they've got like first responders going and getting all the bad stuff out. Uh, and on the gallery walk, I ask, you know, put some feedback to your classmates, put a heart or a check mark for things that work really well for you and will help you remember what those glial cells do. Uh, you can see over here, that they've actually made a comment section and students make comments. Uh, again, this is just another way for students to show that they understand the material. Uh, you can use it as a way of assessing a multiple modality uh, assessment measure. All right, so that would be um, uh, images speak a thousand words. I'm looking at my time. Okay. <laughs> This next one I learned about at the teaching professors conference, which I don't, I don't know if it's okay to say this because this is a different conference, but it was awesome. Uh, I don't know about you all, but when I go to conferences, I always am happy if I learn just one thing. Uh, and I learned a ton of things at the Teaching Professors Conference. And this is one of them. This is called IQ cards. And the only material that's required are the index cards. 
And you ask students, okay, on one side, I'd write you to put, I'd like you to write an I, and I stands for insights. And I would define what you mean by insights, because the first time I did this, I just said, you know, write down an insight. And they wrote definitions, right? They just wrote definitions of what they had learned. So I say now, um, write down an insight that might be a takeaway or a new understanding about something. Maybe it's an application. Like as you're listening, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I realized when I did this, that's an example of that. Maybe it's an aha moment. Right. So on one side, they have their insights. The Q stands for questions. What questions do you have as a result of learning this information? As I was talking about things, did you think, yeah, but what about this? Or, oh, I wonder if that. And you write that question on the back side of the card. Right? Or it may be a question that they have about the course material. Right? So on one side, insights, the other side, questions. And then in terms of follow-up with this, there are different things you can do. You can just collect it, read them yourself, and then maybe share a few things at the next class meeting. You know, I wanted to share some insights with you, and here's a couple of questions that people have that I'd like to answer. And you could do that and be done with it. You could also have students share in groups, right? Take those cards and just share with, share with one another what their insights and questions are. And then something I tried last week to, to dig a little bit deeper, have them think a little bit more intensely, is to give them a post-it note, one of those giant post-it notes. And when they were sharing in their groups, I said, okay, I'd like you to, you know, out of all the questions you hear, out of all the insights that you hear, I'd like you to choose a couple of each, write them on the post-it note, uh, and we're going to share that with the class, and then have them do a gallery walk. And you can see here, we've got, in, you know, the insights are up here, the questions are here, and then there's blank space where people would go and they'd, they'd respond to insights or make comments on people's insights. And then they would also like answer one another's questions. So it's just a way for them to engage more deeply with the information. Now, honestly, with, with uh, IQ cards, uh, it really lets you know kind of what they're taking away and what they're thinking. And you need to be prepared because uh, one time I did an IQ card and under insights or, or just on the card, the student wrote, I don't really know what to write because I don't have any questions and I didn't have any revelations. <laughs> He's keeping it real. Uh, and so that was another reason why I started the second step, right? Maybe there was an insight that somebody else had that might stimulate some thinking in that student. So I am looking at time. May I may I ask, are there questions that that people have or should I continue on? So yes, we do have one question that came through. Um, how long do these assignments take within your class? So it that absolutely depends. Um, with speed dating, the first time you speed date, it you know, people are kind of like, wait, what? But then they get the hang of it. And so it's really up to you. Crumple and shoot. Sometimes I'll do that the last 15 minutes of class. Uh, the first time you do it, give yourself a little more time so they can get the hang of it. These The uh, uh, IQ cards, I give them maybe five minutes at the end of class. Hey, take a look at your notes from our last class meeting or take a look at this particular chapter. Right. And that's where I ask for the IQ. So that may be just five minutes. If I do something like this, that's probably going to be probably 30 minutes right? uh, with Hawks and Eagles. Depends on how many times you want to move them around. It would take probably 10 minutes for sure. With the pictures speak a thousand words that took about an hour because I gave them time to do, you know, to meet in their group and to come up with their with their uh, images and then uh, had the gallery walk. But you can really fine tune these to take as much or as little time as you like. All right, our next one, how do you monitor the matching with the different groups for the memory game? How do you give points or credit or do you give credit? Okay. Um, yeah, sometimes, it, you know, it depends. I may do a couple of things. I may just uh, take that envelope and give a little bit of points for students who um, just were there, like participation and attendance points for completing the activity. 
Other times I will ask on the thing who did what. And I will grade those uh, to see to make sure that things are correct, uh, give them points if uh, the definitions or examples are correct. I've also had other students grade those. And in that case, I make it blind. You know, you don't see the, the people's names there and ask them to rate the different cards from one to five, being very clear. You're going to get the grade that people, you know, the, that your peers are assigning you. Uh, so there are different ways that, that you can do it. And I've tried all three. Oh, I should say this about the memory game. Sometimes students are wrong, right? Sometimes they write down the wrong thing. And actually, that's kind of good because students who are playing the game will go, hold on, I don't think this is right. Because, and then they just start talking about it, right? And so that's actually kind of, you know, uh, a learning opportunity when somebody gets something wrong. And then if there is something, uh, if I'm playing the memory game, I tell them if there's something that, you know, uh, uh, something that somebody wrote that's really helpful for you, write that on the envelope, give them a compliment. If there's a clue that needs some work or was confusing, let them know that as well. Thank you, um, Dr. Merrill. We also have additional time if you wanted to go over a few more ideas. Sure. Um, do that. Sure. Yeah, I have one more and people maybe know about this, but it is Kahoot. Um, and you may play if you don't students really enjoy this game. Um, what you would need is a computer, a Kahoot.com account for the instructor. And what students need is either a computer or a phone. And on their phone, there's a Kahoot app and it's free. Right? With Kahoot, there are different things that you can do. You can review material. And honestly, with Kahoot, it's not a deep dive. It's more like maybe putting a situation up there or, or putting a definition up there. So it's not like deep, intensive learning, but it's a great way to review the material. It's also a very good way to identify problem areas. When you're playing Kahoot, you can see how quickly the answers come in and how, how quickly the answers come in correlate to how comfortable they are with the information. So if I'm playing Kahoot right here, um, I you see which of the following contributes to basic motivation and five groups, and I do it in groups. I have them play in groups. So they're talking with one another, collaborating with one another. Uh, you can see that five groups got it right, but four groups did not. And so that lets me know, I'll say, okay, you know what? Let's just take a break right here and let's, let's review this material. So it allows me to see what they're not understanding at that particular moment, you know, right then and there, and be able to address that. You can also collect feedback uh, from students as well. And so I thought because we have enough time that we could play Kahoot if people are willing to do that. Um, Julie, is that something that I can do? So we do have about five minutes left. Okay, perfect. All right, but everybody, you need to be on it. Okay, here, let's, uh, got it. We have to see if I can do this. And I'm going to stop my share. And now I'm going to go right here. Okay. So I've already made it. And I'm gonna say classic mode, but I would ask students, please join as a team and come up with a team name. Now you see here, it says you would go, actually the, the black bar is right across it. I think it says go to kahoot.com or kahootit.com. You would go to whatever the, um, the web address is there and it will ask you, oh, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Christine. <laughs> so you'd go in there and you would just put in the code. All right, here comes everybody. And I would also, when, we, when we're playing as teams, you know, come up with a team name that has something to, hey, Tom Cruise, that has something to do with class, right? <laughs> and they do, except the baseball team. The baseball team is always the baseball team. Okay. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead and thank you for those of you that were able to log on and join. The, um, I think the code will remain in the bottom right corner. 
and I'm going to go ahead and click start. And usually what I do is a Kahoot at the end of a chapter, right? And they know when we're, when we're playing Kahoot, the chapter's over, we're wrapping it up in a bow and we're moving on. So I'm going to go ahead and start. At least one of the activities that was presented in here was new to me. And you'll notice a couple of things. Number one, it defaults to 20 seconds. So people have 20 seconds to answer. You can change the time if you want to, to be longer or shorter. The other thing that, oh, excellent. The other thing that you will notice is when you are answering, you're forced to look at the screen, right? Because it's looking, it's showing you the colors. So you're having to look up at things. Number two, also a poll. Which of the following activities might you try in your class? Okay. All right. So that lets me know, you know, what people are interested in. And maybe I'm asking students about um, what chapter they want to do next or what topic they'd like to focus on next. I could collect information that way. Which of the following materials are required for crumple and shoot? So this would be an example of maybe um, providing something you've talked about in class just to review and test their knowledge. Yep. So you know what? Throw in and all answers are correct, even when it's not. Because <laughs> they'll go to that. I'm like, sometimes that's not right. I know that it feels like it's going to be right. So sometimes I'll throw in and all answers are correct, even when they're not. But in this case, it is. Right? <laughs> Number four, I will try at least one of the activities suggested in this presentation. Great. And the last one. What's my name? What is your presenter's name? Answers are coming in more slowly on this one. <laughs> Yep, Jennifer Merrill, great, thank you. And so then we go to our podium. In third place, we have Neil, great job, Neil. And then we have Piccolo. Our winner is, who's it gonna be, who is it? Christine, congratulations, and we've got some runners up that are gonna come up, Sophia and Lori, right? So that's how that goes down, I go ahead and close this up. One thing that you can do, um, there we go. One thing that you can do with Hawk or with uh, Crumple and Shoot, no, 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 sorry, uh, with Kahoot is have students create the questions. That way they're engaging a little more deeply with the material. Um, and the thing about Kahoot is you can only have 120 characters. So they have to think really critically about what the most important information to include in those different prompts. All right, Julia, that's it for me. Thank you, Dr. Merrill. We did have um, a couple of questions left. Um, how long do you provide them to answer a question? Was, was there a way to set it yourself or is it a default time? On Kahoot? Yes. I think Kahoot defaults to 20 seconds if it's just individual play. If you do a team play, I believe it gives you 30 seconds. Uh, and I think you can manipulate. I think you can go into settings and uh, um, uh, manipulate the time. Thank you. And the next question, can you share how you might do the memory game in a live online class? 
No, I cannot. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure there's got to be something out there um, that would allow you to have cards that would flip over. Um, but I'm sorry. I, I don't know. Um, one last thing uh, for the PowerPoint presentation, we do have a couple instructors who requested um, access to that. Um, if you would like to share that, will you please send that to our marketing team so they can post it with the webinar recording? Absolutely. And Julia, I, I had sent you something earlier. Uh, the um, Oh, I see that you, you dropped that into the chat, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, I've got the, I tried to do some instructions there to kind of supplement my PowerPoint. But if you have any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy for you to reach out to me. Thank you, Dr. Merrill. Yeah. Um, looks like we're out of time. Okay. Uh, thank you for the valuable information that you shared with us today. IES 2023 continues tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern with a virtual tour of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Dublin. More details and the full Friday schedule can be found on the conference website. While accessing the website, don't forget to swing by the virtual exhibit hall to say hello to the Hawks team. While there, you can do a quick five-minute demonstration, request your t-shirt, and be entered to win a $50 hourly giveaway. Also, in the spirit of St. Patrick's Day, you'll find a few golden coins throughout the conference website. Click on the coins to be entered to win an additional raffle. We will see you at the next session. Thanks again for joining day one of IES 2023. We can't wait to see everyone tomorrow. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. And Julia, thank you so much for moderating. You're Bye. welcome, Dr. Merrill. Bye.